chapter 13, please. For the last 11 months on Sunday mornings, we have been journeying verse by verse and word by word through this book, The Unveiling of Jesus Christ, as he comes back to earth at the end of time. The sin of the world and the rebellion against God is so awful that before God starts to clean it up and purge it, he removes his bride, the true church, all true believers. So the real Christians have already been removed when all of this happens. Now a part of what is going on on the earth is listed from chapter 12 through chapter 18. And we have seen much of that and are coming now to look at the last two characters on the stage of time as the king prepares to return from heaven and the earth makes its last ditch stand to create a world without God. And finally, it's so bad, on the calendar of God's timetable, he says, that's enough. The hand is struck midnight, the king comes and smashes the devil and his crowd, and Jesus takes his world back and redeems the earth and the body and society and politics and the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Son. But before that happens, the devil has his day. It's a seven-year period called the tribulation. The last three and a half years are the worst. And in that three-and-a-half-year period of time, there are two people on earth in charge of things running a world kingdom against God that are very important. One of them is called the Antichrist. He is the devil for the first time in history, though there have been Antichrists. The Antichrist is the first time in history that the devil completely controls a man. He is completely in union with him. As Christ is God incarnate, so the Antichrist is the devil incarnate in a man. There is a second important world leader. He's called the false prophet. As a true prophet of God, it is my responsibility to point to Christ. As any false prophet, he points to the devil. The 13th chapter divides itself in the first 11 verses talking about the Antichrist and a little background on him. He's called beast number one. The second character, the false prophet, we'll look at next week, who points men to him and honors men to him, is in verse 11 to 18. And he's called beast number two. And so today we're going to look at five things about the beast, beast number one, who is the Antichrist, as we shall see. There are five things in these first 11 verses. Number one, the wonder of the Antichrist, the wonder of this beast. I have told you there are two Greek words in Revelation translated wonder. One of them means a sign, the woman. Israel, God's timetable to the world is that kind of sign. But this is not that wonder. It is an awesome beast, a spectacle. No thing in the world that the whole civilization has ever seen anything like this fella before. And I stood upon the sand of the sea. This is still another of John's 12 or 13 different revelations that comprise the revelation. And I saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horn ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. It wasn't a leopard. It was something like unto a leopard. And his feet were not the feet of a bear, but as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, that's the devil, gave him, the false, the Antichrist, his power and deceit and great authority. This is indeed a wondrous beast, a spectacle like unto which the world has never, ever seen before. The devil incarnate, the Antichrist, 
taking over the systems of this world and controlling them. And ultimately, after military and political dominance of the world, striving for religious dominance. That's why you've got a false prophet. Because the devil knows man is incurably religious. And any system to control the politics and the minds and the lives of men must have a counterpart attempt to control them spiritually. In the Roman Empire, the government and the church were in collusion. In this revised Roman Empire type of world system at the end, so will the false church, the Laodicean church, the real church having been removed, be in collusion with the government. And so we see the rise of the false of the Antichrist. I want to call your attention to some things. First, this beast, this Antichrist, is viewed as rising out of the sea. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that one day somebody's going to be sailing along like old Cliff Halstead out there trout fishing in the bay? And he's going to get on his radio and call Walkie Walkie 2 or something. I see a beast coming out of uh, North Bay over here. No, that's not what it means. What then does it mean? Turn to Revelation 15. Uh, I'm sorry, 17. Revelation 17. And let's look at verse number 15. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. In visionary language, in Bible language, the sea means the sea of humanity. The waters are the waters of the people, of every kind and clime and tongue and tribe and nation. Daniel uses the expression twice. Isaiah uses it at least twice. A sea of humanity. Therefore, the Antichrist rises out of the sea of humanity and is himself a human. Now, many believe that the Antichrist is a system, is a movement, is a philosophy. Not so. He is a human. He rises out of the sea of humanity. Now, we have seen that he has ten horns, and the ten horns represent ten kings, which are rulers of ten world powers, which form a confederation and uh, give power to the beast and receive power from him. Turn again to Revelation chapter 17, this time verse 12. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet. They haven't got a kingdom yet. But they do receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Daniel showed us in his vision a statue of four kingdoms of the world. There was first of all the Babylonian kingdom, the Medo-Persian kingdom, the Grecian kingdom under Alexander the Great, and finally the Roman Empire. The only four kingdoms that have ever ruled the world. The ultimate, final, and last world kingdom will be a visionary recreation of that world empire. And so we believe that there will be ten toes, ten horns, or ten nations. So, as the Roman Empire was a European commodity, so historians and Bible scholars have looked for years to the day that ten nations would get together and form a powerful confederacy in Europe. Hence, we know the birth of the European common market with Greece as the tenth member since May or June of 79. Now, we can expect then that this king, this world ruler, this political power will rise out of the European common market, the recreated world empire, the revised Roman empire, so to speak. It is interesting that that which gave birth to and holds together the Roman Empire is finance. And that by which the Antichrist will control the world is finance. The inability of men to even exist physically can't even buy or sell food unless they give honor to him. So we believe the Antichrist will probably be a, a Gentile and a European as opposed to being a Jew. How does he control the world? How does he take charge? What gives him his credibility and his popularity? 
obviously, as we've seen months back, in the four horsemen of the apocalypse, because he, as the Antichrist, brings a false peace. The trigger hot spot of the world from here on will be nothing but the Middle East, the conflict between the Arab nations and the Jewish nations. Again, trouble this week over Israel, over Jerusalem. Again this week, Arab ambassadors walking out of the United Nations. It's heating up once again. We'll keep our attention focused on what's happening over there. Now, in the, in the problems that arise, in the uh, somebody is going to have an answer that will bring a false peace for three and a half years, probably, between the Israelites and their Arab friends. And they will be, the world will so acclaim him and his ability to bring peace that, that they'll make him a world ruler and then he'll sit down on the throne, promised to, his father, promised to Jesus, Jesus to reign on the throne of his father David. He'll make the Jews quit shedding blood and worshiping God and make them start worshiping him. That's the abomination of desolation. It hits the fan. Temple worship stops. They're scattered to the hills. The Gentile armies invade. The temple is overrun. The Armageddon is on. We've been through that many, many times. Now, what is this thing that looks like the, a leopard but has the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion? Historians believe that undoubtedly the first empire the world has known, the Babylonian Empire, was the meanest and the most fierce the world has ever known. Here then is the fierceness of a lion. The most powerful, though not nearly as fierce and mean, the kinder but the stronger was the strength of the bear, the Medo-Persian Empire. No empire was ever established as quickly as the Grecian Empire. Like a lion that is, like a leopard that is fast, Alexander the Great conquered the world more swiftly than ever did his predecessors or successors. Consequently, it may well be that this symbolic language means the last great world kingdom will embody all of the ferocity, the power, and the swiftness of control of all the other world empires combined. Why is there not a fourth? Because the fourth was the Roman Empire, and this is the, the Roman Empire recreated in the European common market. Now you will notice that this thing is invincible. He is powerful. He is awesome. He takes control of the world. He can do anything. And where does he get his strength? Listen. Look at the end of verse 2. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. Don't miss this. The devil, the dragon, is the great counterfeiter, counterfeiting everything God does. God incarnates himself in Jesus, and we, Jesus incarnates himself in us. The devil is incarnate in this man and he in his people. The devil's crowd and the devil's antichrist are in complete incarnation with him. We get our power from the indwelling Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. He gets his power from the indwelling incarnation of the devil. We are seated in the heavenlies, positionally in Christ through the Holy Spirit. He gets his seat on the throne of David for three and a half years before Christ comes and takes it all back from him from the devil. We are given authority over demons, over sickness, over sin, death, hell, and the grave in the name of Jesus Christ, invincible conquerors in the name of Christ. He gets his authority, his seat, and his power from the devil. And so the world, just before we see a thousand-year kingdom under Christ, now we see a three-and-a-half-year kingdom under the devil. And why only three-and-a-half years? Because that's all the world can stand. Because the elect who will be saved as tribulation saints couldn't stand the persecution. So for the sake of the elect, the, the period of time is shortened. Now the second thing I want to call to your attention is the wound of the devil. This is a very speculative, interesting passage of Scripture. Verse 3, I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. He is pictured as having ten kings or ten horns of power and seven heads. Now, 
there are ten crowns on these heads. So on, we're on the heads, now on the horns of power. So it may mean, as we have said, that at least three of these governments pull away and he starts to lose control. One of them appears to be fatally wounded and miraculously and quickly he pulls it all back together. So that which gives him a, his authority is that he's a miracle worker. He can solve problems. He can put governments back together. He can make, co make again, cohesive, divided national entities. And I don't think that this means that one of these heads means that he dies and gets resurrected. The devil hasn't got the power to, to resurrect anybody. Only Jesus can do that. The devil is, can only give death. He cannot give life. He's the Lord of death. Jesus Christ is the Lord of life. And only life can overpower death. No, I don't, mean it, I don't think it means the Antichrist is resurrected from the dead. I think it means that the Antichrist starts to lose and does lose a fatal blow, one of these great powers, and somehow, in an instant, in a moment, solves it, puts his empire back together, and the world wonders after him. All the world wondered after the beast. He can solve any problem. He can work out any difficulty. He can do anything. So consequently, because they wonder at his physical and material and his military and his political power, is it any wonder now that the world begins to wonder, maybe this man is God. Maybe he's the long-awaited Messiah. Maybe this is the Christ. Boy, the devil starts to hear that, and the Antichrist says, yeah, 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 he likes that. And all the time, the false prophet is saying, he is the Christ. He's more than a man. And so we see the third thing, the worship of the beast, verse 4. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto him, who is able to make war with him. He is pictured as invincible, even as God can do anything, thus as worshiped. And so the religious worship follows naturally his political success. Notice, as we worship God the Father and Christ the Son in whom he is incarnate, so they worship under the attention of the false prophet, the dragon, the devil, and his incarnation, and they worship the beast. Nobody can stand against it. He's invincible. He can do everything. He is indeed God. Now, everybody is saying that except a few. Turn over to verse 8. See those few. All that dwell on the earth shall worship him. That is to say, except those whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The only ones who won't worship him are the Christians. Now, many of you are just come in for the first time, and uh, I know some of this is confusing. Let me say this to you. You and I are saved by faith in Christ, period. But at the end of the church age, and that occurs when all saved people are raptured out, and for seven years under the devil all hell breaks loose, people are going to continue to live. They'll continue to multiply. They'll continue to have children. They'll come to the age of accountability. Jewish evangelists who have believed on Christ will be preaching all over the world. Folks will be being saved. But the devil will say, will so control the economic system of this world, you can't even buy or sell unless you've got his card, his credit card, so to speak, his staff, his number, saying you honor him on your head or on the back of your hand. That's what we would do in a cashless society and in a credit cardless society, which we'll quickly go to because you, you, know, you lose your credit card, don't have any cash, you're out of luck, so it's indelibly somewhere in your body. But a man who receives Christ, can only receive Christ by saying to the devil, I, the Antichrist, I won't receive your mark. So he can't live. He's beheaded. John, earlier in Revelation, saw a group of people saved out of the church age and another whole bunch he didn't know who was. He said, who's this crowd? And the angel said, they're the ones that were saved out of the tribulation age who were beheaded for their witness for Christ because they wouldn't receive the mark of the beast. So you who are saved in the stadium this week, you who are Christians now, we're lucky. We're blessed. We've been saved by faith in Christ. Those of your brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and friends who wait and don't get saved till after the rapture, they'll be saved not by faith in Christ, but by faith in Christ plus refusing to receive the mark of the beast and being beheaded. It'll cost them their life to be saved. 
And so everybody worshiped him except, verse 8, those who received not his mark and gave their lives for their very salvation. All right, I want us to look at another thing. The fourth thing I want to call to your attention is the warfare that goes on against him that he creates against the world. Verse 5. Now let me pause right here and say that the main kind of warfare the devil puts on the world and on the saints and on believers and on everybody is a verbal warfare, a blasphemous warfare. And in, a, in, in, in government, in education, in entertainment, in philosophy, in science, everywhere there is humanism, Everywhere there is atheism, there is, there is God, we, we just say we can live it alone. Man can solve all of his problems. Man has the answer to everything, and that's blasphemy. And this attack turns into real warfare, and it's continued for 42 months. And he opens his mouth in blasphemy. He never stops, he never lets up, putting God down and blaspheming him and his tabernacle and them that dwell in and everybody on earth. And listen in verse number 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Now, wait a minute. In what sense can the devil have victory over the tribulation age saints in the sense that you may say he overcomes them? In this sense. He can overcome them physically. He can kill them. But by their faith in the death of Christ, it is another death that ultimately gives them victory over their physical death. And so they overcame him in physical death. But they don't die spiritually because of their faith in the death of Christ. They can stand physical death and be martyred. Turn with me, if you will, please, over to verse, chapter 15, verse 2. Chapter 15, verse 2. And I saw, as it were, a great sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. Here are the beheaded martyrs expressed as having gotten victory over the devil. But we just read that the devil, the Antichrist, got victory over them. You see, the devil overstepped himself on the cross. By a death, he thought he had destroyed Jesus and the gospel. But it was by that death and because of that death that we live so that we never die because we belong to him. So we have victory over the devil and death because of Christ's death. Now just so, because of their love for the Lord Jesus, their faith in him, they can have victory even though they have to go through physical death because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life in death for them. And that's what the thing ends up with. And I want to call to your attention one last thing. We've looked at the wonder of the beast, the wound, the worship, and the warfare. Look at the warning about the beast. And it ends in verse number 9 and 10. Verse 9. If any man have ear to have an ear, let him hear. How many times in this series, back in Revelation 2 and 3, remember, did we hear the expression, if any man hath an ear to hear what the Spirit saith to the churches, let him hear. But now it's not what the Spirit saith to the churches, because the church is gone. The church is raptured. The church is in heaven. Now it's just, if any man hath an ear, let him hear. This is any man. The whole world better hear this. And what is it we'd better hear? Verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with a sword. What does it mean? Just this. If you reject Jesus Christ in this life, in this dispensation, in this church age, when God is dealing with man on faith, and you wait to come under the kingdom of death, if you wait to be saved in the kingdom of death, the kingdom of the sword, when the devil rules and kills, it will cost you death to be saved in the age of death. That's what it means. And those who are saved in the age of death are saved by going through death and faith in Christ. How will they do so? Here is, you might put in a parenthesis, the ultimate display of the patience and the faith of the saints. Those tribulation age saints, by faith in Christ, by tribulation, by, by patience in the midst of tribulation, will be saved. 
He says, whoa, warning, world, hear this. You don't want to be saved by going through death in the kingdom of death. You want to be saved by coming to him who is life in the kingdom of life and light. And that's right now. May we bow our heads together as we pray. Our Father and our God, we pray that this awesome warning about being saved right now while there's time, while there's a chance, will grip the hearts of many as it has the hearts of so many in the stadium. And we pray that many, many, many will come to you this day and follow you and be saved now in this dispensation by amazing grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want us all to stand for just a moment. And I want to ask you a question. How many of you are here this morning and you were saved in the Crusades? Sunday night through last night. Children, teenagers, moms, dads. For the first time in your life, you know, you prayed a prayer and meant it. Lord, come into my heart. I'm not going to play the game and pretend to be a Baptist or Methodist or something else. I've repented. I've been born again. I've received Christ. Lord, come into my heart. I accept you as my Savior and save me. How many of you came forward and prayed that prayer for the first time in your life? You accepted Jesus. You walked down an aisle. You were really saved in that crusade. I want you to get up and leave your seat and come right now and stand here facing me. Would you please? Everybody, right now. Men, women, teenagers, kids, old, young, everybody. You were saved in the crusade. You came and trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior for the first time in your life and you know it was real. I'd like you to get up and come and stand right down here at the front. Let's sing together. I love to tell the story of the 